everybody. Good evening and welcome to our Healthy Heart session. Our usual Tuesday evening culturally tailored nutrition education, nutrition and lifestyle education, where we talk about so many nutrition related topics, you know, um, just to help us help people in our community make informed choices when it comes to their health, when it comes to nutrition and lifestyle in general. Um, this week, we have an interesting topic, again, something we've never done here before. I have a colleague lecturer called Mariam who talked to me about food fraud. I, I thought that was interesting. So I was asking her what we could discuss. And then she said, what about food fraud? And I was like, what is food fraud? Because I really hadn't heard about it before. And then she gave me an example of the horse scandal. And I'm sure she's going to be talking about it. You know, when was this? 2013. You know, so issues like that. Um, so she's going to talk to us about what this is you know, what we should look out for. She also mentioned that example of um, a lot of products we have in our shops, you know, the African and Caribbean shops have all these products that have these claims, health and nutrition claims. How do we know if these claims are true or not? This, among other interesting um, things, is what we have today. And we are going to invite uh, Maria. Maria is a lecturer to lead on today's discussion. So please, wherever you are, Facebook, YouTube, if you're on the call now, drop in your questions. You don't have to wait till the end. Please just um, put your hand up or drop your question in the chat box and we will address these for you. So without much ado, I would invite Mariam to start her session. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, Eva, are you have disabled participants to share me? Right. Um, Sam, are you able to make a call? Yeah, yeah, I've made a call. -host. Thank you. You're still disabled. Are you still disabled? Yeah. Now I see co-host here. You have been made a co-host. It says all oh, disabled participants can share. Uh, okay, go ahead. Please try again. Okay. Okay, I think it's okay now. Oh. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mariam Ojo. I'm a lecturer in nutrition with De Montfort University in Leicester. Uh, today I will be talking about food fraud. How can we be smarter? I know a lot of some people will have heard about food fraud while some of us would not have heard about it. So the purpose of this lecture today is just to enlighten us about what food fraud is and how we can take care and not fall a victim of food fraud. But before I proceed, I would like to ask a question. Are we really eating what we think we are eating? Sometimes we buy food from our shops, whether it's from the conventional, the conventional uh, shops in the United States or United Kingdom or wherever we are, or we that are foreigners in this part of the world, maybe we are buying from the African shops or Caribbean shops. Are we really sure that what we are buying from these shops are what we expect and what we are actually eating what we expect to be eating. So today we are going to be talking about different aspects of food fraud and we are going to enlighten us about it. By the end of this lecture, I expect that every participant in this seminar or this uh, workshop will have had an idea of what food fraud is and how to prevent themselves from falling a victim of food fraud. So what are the things we are going to be discussing today? We are going to talk about the meaning of food fraud, and what we are, why, why do we have to be concerned as a consumer? And what food are at risk of food fraud? And which countries are affected? And efforts of the government? And how do we prevent ourselves from falling a victim? So food fraud is actually a dishonest act or omission related to production or supply of food with the intention of personal gain, which will cause a loss to another, another party. It is economically motivated. It's as an adulteration that is economically motivated. And it is a crime. It's a criminal offense against the Food Safety Act of 1990. 
This food fraud we are talking about, it can occur at any point in the food chain, from the farm to the plate, whether it's occurring at the farm level with the farmers, or it's occurring at the, at the middleman level, where we have the wholesalers and the retailers, or it's actually occurring even in our restaurant at the stage of where we are going to eat it in the restaurant. So it occurs at every part of the food chain. So let us go on to talk about food fraud. When we are talking about food fraud, we are talking about substitution, contamination, the gray markets, tampering with food, mislabeling, unapproved enhancements. Let's take this one after the other. When we are talking about contaminants, we are, it's either we have organic contaminants or we have inorganic contaminants. But most of the time we are talking about contaminants, we are talking about the inorganic aspect of contaminants. You know, most of these are our food, when they are grown on the farm, they put fertilizers, and things like that, a lot of uh, chemical herbicides and pesticide and whatever side that they put on these plants to, for them to be, to be able to have a very good harvest. Sometimes this food gets contaminated as a result of these chemicals that are added to this food. But because a lot of our, cost, a lot of our farmers don't, even, don't have the opportunity of doing the quality assessment of that food material before it is being taken out for, for, for sale. So sometimes, these food are contaminated with some chemicals. So as a result of that, by the time it gets to the end consumer on the food, on the, on the, on the table, this contaminant may still be present in this, part of, in this particular food. Sometimes some food producers in the factory, they may tell us this food does not have any additive, does not have any colorant, does not have any artificial flavor, artificial color, artificial whatever, artificial sweetener. But in actual fact, if we go and take the quality assessment of these food materials, it may actually contain some level or some, uh, some elements of these artificial, artificial food materials. Sometimes, in order to make a lot of profit, some food producers can use unapproved enhancements. Let's give an example. Somebody that is producing a food that requires a sweetener. There are different types of sweetener in the shop. There are different types of sweeteners in the market. Some are healthy, some are not. But because we want to make a lot of profit as a producer, if I go for an unhealthy sweetener to put in my food, example is shakarin, we call it shakarin. If I go out and add this into the food, shakarin ordinarily is not healthy for the body because there has been some the research that has said that shakarin can cause a lot of chronic diseases like kidney disease and liver disease because it's harmful to human consumption. But sometimes people just take shakarin on their own. Though if it is, if the person, if the individual has gone to buy shakarin and eat it by himself, yes, it's good that he's putting himself at risk. But it's not the responsibility of the food producer to add shakarin instead of putting ordinary sugar into the food just to make it sweet. And you are claiming that it doesn't have an artificial sweetener. Shakarin is not natural, it's chemical, it's, not, it's definitely artificial. So if you tell me that the food product does not contain artificial, artificial sweetener, then why does it contain shakarin? Sometimes some people will just mix a, a percentage of shakarin with the percentage of normal sucrose, which is the normal sugar we have on our, ta our table sugars. So when, but so that we not have, you not be able to detect the taste of this shakarin in that particular food. Artificial flavors, artificial colors and a lot of other food materials or other chemicals that are being added to our food on we we when we our cons, we consumers do not even have knowledge of it counterfeiting is another thing some people produce a uh, counterfeit version of original food products because they want to do um they they want to in 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 academics we call it plagiarism copying somebody's work as if it's your own so it's like they want to pre 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 prepare that food product when it is the original remedy, the original regimen or the original ingredient and the method of preparation is not theirs. So in, and in a time of to do this, and they want to make, they make the quality cheaper. They want quality, they make it less of less quality and they will sell it at a lesser price. So sometimes buying something cheap, when you know that ordinarily this, I think this thing should, is cheaper than I expect, may actually be a, 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 an issue of food fraud. Sometimes 
Some ingredients in food materials can be substituted with other things that are not actually fit for human consumption. So when we are talking about food fraud, what are the factors that will contribute to food fraud? When there is no control measures, a very strong control measure to food or food production in every part of the food chain, even with the, in the, at the, farms, at the farm level, the amount of fertilizer that's supposed to be added, the amount of herbicide, the amount of insecticide, you know, pesticide or whatever they want to add to the plant to make it grow well, the amount of, you know, the way they are going to process the food, package the food, and the time, the time interval between farm harvest and then being transferred to the other, the next chain in the food, and the next person in the food chain. Do all these things need to be controlled? There should be rules and regulations. There should be guidelines for everything, all these things. So sometimes in the handling of food along the food chain, contamination can occur. You know, when they are being transported from one place to the other. Some, I will give you an example of countries, um, my own country in Africa, where, you know, everybody does do anything that they like. Most of the time, you don't uh, see any, uh, any uh, strong hold or any strong parastata that is being involved in monitoring what is being, uh, what is being carried out. So most of these things, sometimes engine oil we make with food material, with vegetables and things like that. And by the time they get to the final consumer, it's already contaminated with engine oil from the, from the vehicle that is used to transport the vegetables. So these are the kind of things that occur at the end of the day. Availability of opportunity. Sometimes these people, because they see a loophole in the guideline or in the procedure or in what or whatever, in the steps that needs to be taken, to produce food materials or to make food materials available for consumers. That loophole is actually what these people that want to part well, that want to get involved in food food, we make use of. So because they saw that loophole in there, then they will just make use of that loophole and explore it. Economic factors. We said food fraud is for the benefit of financial gain. So because food fraud is for the benefit of financial gain, that is the main idea behind food fraud. Sometimes when the, the food chain is too complex, it may be difficult to monitor the activities along the food chain such that at the end of the day, food fraud can occur. So as consumers, why should we have to be concerned? I mentioned some minutes ago that contamination is one of the things that occur with food frauds. Sometimes food can contain some allergens. It can contain some allergens and can contain some contaminants. We are going to give example of this as we go along. Allergens, what are allergens? Allergens are some materials in food that some people can react to. And sometimes it can create a very devastating effect to that individual. Some people don't, have, don't eat anything that contains peanuts. Sometimes some people don't eat anything that contains gluten. So there's a lot of allergies, whether in grains or in protein materials or in whatever, there are a lot of allergies, but it is the responsibility of the food producer to critically indicate it, specifically indicate the allergen that is inside that food, such that whoever is allerg allergic to that particular material will not be able to consume that material. And I've briefly mentioned something about contaminants, whether it's biological one, or is that the artificial contaminant? When I'm saying a biological one, I'm talking about infectious materials, infectious organisms. And when I take the uh, physical ones, we are talking about the chemicals and other things that can contaminate food. Then as a consumer, some, some people have religious needs. Some people don't eat uh, anything that contains animal. They are vegetarian, they are, they are because they, are, they, con they don't eat anything that contains animal food or animal products. So religious belief, like Muslims, they have a particular kind of meat. They eat animal food, but it has to be prepared in a particular way. So it's supposed to be allowed. So if it's not indicated of, on that food material that this animal product is allowed, then it is, it is the Muslims are at risk of eating what they are not expected to eat. Then dietary requirements, Vegetarians and people, that, some other people that have, maybe as a result of their medical condition or whatever, they can have dietary recommendations when it comes to feeding. So if this kind of things, if the food label does not critically state 
what are the things that are contained in that particular food, then it will be difficult for people that have diet, special dietary requirements to be able to eat what is necessary and what they are supposed to eat. And sometimes people claim something is organic when actually it is not. Vegetables, especially. Fresh vegetables, leafy vegetables, tuba vegetables, and whatever. Most of the time is, is usually pertain to vegetables and some tuba, some tuba crops. So some of these crops, they have been grown. Not only organic, they are not totally organic because they have been, there are some artificial things that have been added in terms of inorganic fertilizer or inorganic, you know, a lot of other chemicals that have been added to this food product. But if you claim, if the producer or the farmer is claiming that this particular food or this particular vegetable is organic, when in actual fact, it is not. So then this is also regarded as food fraud. So the foods that are at risk, this is a list of most of the foods that are usually at risk of food fraud. Oil, the fish. In this table, you can you will see olive oil, but it's not only in olive oil. Most of the times, it's usually in all different types of oil. And particular in Africa, we are talking about palm oil here. A lot of African countries cook with palm oil. We are going to give us examples of cases that have been discovered in Africa where we have food food in palm oil. We, are, we can have fish, we can have organic foods, as I've mentioned before. Milk, recently I, I saw a video that people have started producing milk when they are not actually getting the milk from cow. They are producing milk artificially. But when you drink it, you believe that it is the ordinary milk that is gotten from cow. But when it's at, in actual fact, it, is, it was not got from cow. It's a labo laboratory prepared milk. So sometimes grains can have issues with food fraud. We can have wine, we can have coffee and tea, certain juices and things like that. Sometimes on, your, on the bottom of your juice, you see no additives, no added, uh, you know, no added sugar, no artificial flavor, no artificial colors and things like that. So on, your, on the bottom of your juice. So which countries are affected? We are going to analyze the countries that have been affected so far about food fraud. So at the end of the day, we are going to be able to decide, okay, what part of the world is, is affected and what part is not. So in 2020, it was observed that ketchup was produced using unsafe fake illegal products in India. And in 2018, or imported only in Canada was adulterated with foreign sugars. In 2012, vodka was laced with methanol in Czech Republic. And in 2007, puffer fish mislabeled as monkfish in California in the United States of America. But the main one that has caused a, a, a kind of an issue throughout the world is the horsemeat scandal in the United Kingdom in 2013. In a place where the supplier of the horsemeat supplied it as beef, whereas it was actually horse meat. And this supplier supplied it to the common shops like Tesco, like Aldi, where myself and yourself go to purchase our food products. And as a result of this, the consumer were at a risk of ingesting a chemical that is nicknamed boot. It's actually phenyl butazone. This chemical is one of the chemicals that is used in the treatment of horses and it's not fit for human consumption. Because this, this supplier has supplied horse meat, then it's placing this, the, the consumers of that particular uh, product at a risk of what contamination with uh, this chemical that is, which is not actually used in humans, is not fit for consumption in humans. And because of, of the fact that it can cause a lot of uh, conditions like kidney diseases, liver diseases, and even can pro pro uh, prone the consumers to issues like cancer. So I believe on this platform, we have a combination of Africans and Caribbeans and you know, people, the BAM community, the ethnic minority community. So let's look at our, the other places, not particularly in the Western world. In Nigeria, it was found that milk powder was analyzed and it was found that the milk powder did not have animal protein. And we want to imagine a situation where you analyze milk powder, which we are supposed to get from cow and it's not containing any animal protein. To the consumer, they believe they are eating, they, they believe they are consuming normal milk, whereas they are not consuming milk. Then vegetable oil made of recycled oil, 
unfit for human consumption in Kenya. It was observed that engine oil that is used for vehicles was recycled, was made to, you know, to look like vegetable oil as a result of some processes that they undergo. So as a result, by the time they finish all the processing, it will look like vegetable oil. To the consumers, they believe they are eating vegetable oil. You see situation where you see ordinary oil, ordinary vegetable oil being laced with Sudan, Sudan 4. This Sudan 4 is a colorant. It's, it gives color to the particular food products, but it is not fit for consumption because it's carcinogenic. This has been seen in Ghana. It can be, it has, it has been seen in, observed in Nigeria and other parts of the Western, West African countries. It was also observed that formalin was used to keep fish and meat fresh in Uganda. And corn powder was dyed with Sudan 4 and labeled as chili pepper or curry powder. And they would just put some flavors that is to make it smell like curry. And before you know it, you already put it in your jollof rice or your fried rice or whatever. And this Sudan 4 is actually not fit for consumption. I believe some of us that have come from Africa, maybe we are aware of the plastic rice case that was so, that cut across a lot of countries in West Africa some years back. There was issue of plastic rice and people continue to wonder how, how come plastic was used to make rice? How come if, if plastic was actually used to make rice, will it be possible for you to cook it and it will get cooked and you'll be able to eat it? And there were a lot of hula baloo about plastic rice and things like that. This plastic rice issue was actually rice chaff that was packaged as high grade rice. So what efforts has been in place from the government? There has been a development of vulnerability assessments and critical control points. This is similar to the HACCP, hazard analysis and critical control points that is used in the industries to, to identify uh, issues like infection, in infectious materials in food or contamination in food. So this was developed when the issue of food fraud started coming up and there are lots of cases of food fraud in different parts of the world. So it was developed to identify at a particular point in the food chain, at specific point in the food chain, if there's any possibility of infection, you know, contamination from un, uh, unwanted materials or um, claiming what is not supposed to be claimed or containing what is not supposed, the food is containing what is not uh, supposed to contain and things like that. So this was developed and it was decided among some countries that they are going to be using this as a method, especially countries in this, in the Western world, the United States and the United Kingdom. And the threat analysis and critical control points, that's the TACCP. This is also a, um, a similar thing to HACCP, which I've mentioned before is used to identify the threats that are available in food products. This is carried out at different points in the food chain of, uh, of the, in the food chain before they get to the final consumer. Then there's this rapid on-site and non-destructive fingerprinting test that was developed in India and some Asian country, countries too, which was used to, you know, they just use finger, fingerprinting tests to, develop, to identify the kind of things that are occurring. And this thing, this particular one was actually adopted by some countries in Africa too, such that you know, those countries like Uganda, some countries like Kenya, they have adopted this method. Because you know we, we consume a lot of palm oil in Africa, it's one of the basic food materials that we consume in Africa. So it was developed and they, some of the countries in Africa has adopted this method to be able to identify the quality of the palm oil and the rice um, and some other food materials that we use. So the codex, Alimentary, you know, there's what, what we call the colors, colors, alimentarius, uh, colors, alimentarius, which is the combination of the World Health Organization and the Food and Agricultural Organization Initiative, which sets a standard for food. And this has, has been accepted globally from, with, oh, from most of the countries. So, in the food, particular, we have to meet with the standards of food. But it's quite unfortunate that it is this is not being implemented in every country of the world. This is not the fault of the WHO and not the fault of the FAO, but it's the fault of the government of each country. What is being put in place such that food materials that is being produced within the country or imported into the country must meet up with the standards of safe food. 
I saw that at the end of the day, the consumers of the in the country will not be consuming what they are not supposed to consume. Then the enforcing of extensive labeling regulations is also one of the methods that has been put in place by the government to make sure that every food product should be labeled accurately, indicating whether it's containing any allergens or any um, food additives in terms of colorants, in terms of flavors, in terms of sweetener or whatever. You indicate specifically what kind of ingredients has been used in this particular food product such that the consumer will be, uh, will be able to understand what they are eating. But sometimes some of these additives are coded. You will see E, E221, E500, but um, which is to a layman, to a lay consumer, does not have any meaning because they do not understand what this means. So this is one of the things I've seen as a limitation to this method of enforcing labeling. If you want to label and let the, the common man or the lay consumer understand the content of the food that is being eaten, then you, you should use things that are that can be easily understood by the consumer, by the lay consumer. Just assume that everybody is not educated in terms of food materials or in terms of food production or in terms of food added, additives. Somebody like me, I have to go online to check what E221 means or what E334 means. So, but so some people, they do not even have access. They don't have the opportunity to go online to check the meaning of E221. So let us use, that is one of the limitations I've seen with this method of enforcing extensive labeling. Because if you are labeling and you are using the method or you are using the words that is not common or that is not easily understood by the consumer, then eventually the consumer will still not know what you have written on the label. So, for us as, a, as consumers, what do we do? What is our own role? Because when we are talking about food fraud, it should be a collaborative effort. From me as a citizen, from the producer as a producer of food, even from the, to, from the supplier as a supplier of food, everybody in the food chain, even and with the government, to collaborate together to fight against this menace of food fraud. So, as a consumer, what are my responsibilities? I have to be meticulous. Number one is that I have to be vigilant and be meticulous in buying food. For those of us that are educated and we know a little bit about nutrition and things like that, when we go to the shop to buy food, we should look at the labels. We should read food labels. But we have observed that most people, even to the educated people, they just pick up food material from the shelves, pay and get out. They do not bother about to read, even to the extent that sometimes you get home and you discover that this food has actually expired. You didn't even bother to check the best before date or the expiry dates. You see, so once you get home, that you now discover that, oh, this food is actually expired or it will expire by the end of the month. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to finish it by the end of the month. So those are the kind of things that we need to look out for. So when you are looking at the, and when we look at the food label, what do we look out for? Especially when we are when we are looking at the food label, let us look at the content. What that look at the composition of that food. Let's look at the ingredients that is being that is made, you know, that is that has been used to prepare this particular food product. It is very, very important that we have to be meticulous, we have to scrutinize when we are buying food products. Then that's bring us to the second world that we, let's let's cultivate the habit of reading food labels. And whenever we notice a sign of food fraud. It is our responsibility to raise alarm. Let's call the attention of the person that is buying it. If they are buying for a very big shop like the normal conventional RG, Tesco, or whatever, we can always talk to the member of staff to link us up with the manager and call the attention of the manager to this kind of things. And if you are buying from our local African or Caribbean shops where we buy our traditional foods, then we call the attention of the person that is selling that food and you know, to, call, to, uh, to notify them about what we have observed. Then let's look out for natural colors in our food products. If you're buying palm oil, I believe we all have grown up eating palm oil. Some, for, so, for those of us that have come from Africa, and we know the, how the natural color of palm oil is. Though if palm oil is in the thick states, 
it's there's a way it looks. And if it's in the you no know, very liquid state, it, there's a way it looks. But I usually what I do is that I usually go for the palm oil that looks natural to me. So let's look out for natural colors of food. Sometimes you this most of these things that you see, they will be so they have aesthetic value, they you know, they call attention to the eyes and they look so enticing, they look so, you know, they entice you to buy them. But if you actually, if you're actually meticulous and you look very well, you scrutinize what you are buying, you may be able to identify foods that have been, you know, adulterated. Then we need to educate our local agribusiness suppliers. For people like us that are Caribbean, that are Africans, that we don't, we cannot do without buying our traditional foods. Because whatever is being produced is, whatever they, is being produced in our country is what they will bring into the UK for us. And when they are bringing them into the UK, the UK government may not have the opportunity to scrutinize or analyze this particular food that they bring in, even when they want to analyze. They just take random samples of these food products. And that may not be on a regular basis. If your food agribusiness supplier is getting supplies from Africa or getting supplies from your own country twice or three, four times in a, in a month, even if the government is going to take samples from them, it may not be, it, just, it may be just from one batch of the supply that the person is getting. And sometimes they may not, even throughout a month, they may not take any sample to be analyzed from that supplier. So eventually, it is what they bring in that we will buy and we eat. So we need to educate them such that when they go out there to buy their materials that they want to bring into us to come and sell to us here, then it is very, very important that they, they too should scrutinize whatever they want to buy. And they should always buy from trusted suppliers. They will buy from trusted supplier and we as consumer, final consumer too, we need to buy from somebody that we trust because if you, you know, if the person is the kind of person that agrees with you when it comes to this kind of ideology, then you will all, all, both of you will be able to work hand in hand such that at the end of the day, we are going to be able to eradicate the deepest problem of food fraud. So it is the responsibility of the government on their home to put in place some measures. At the same time, we, the final consumers, we need to put in place our own measures too. We need to take our own part. We need to play our own part in this problem of food fraud because we are the we will be at the end and we are at the receiving end we are the final consumers we are definitely going to be at, at the receiving end so we need to play a very important role when it comes to food fraud so these are the materials i've been able to put together on this topic of food fraud so if uh, i will be willing to take any questions uh, if you have any questions thank you very much Thank you so much, Mariam. Yes, can you kindly stop sharing so we can okay. have a discussion? I, I want to believe that <clears throat> people would have questions and comments because um, I think your, your talk was really, really insightful. Touched on a lot, a lot of issues. I have a lot of things I want to share, but I'm going to, first of all, give the opportunity to the audience to see if anyone has any comment or any question at all um, for Mariam to answer before um, I can. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, yes, Janet, go on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam, for, for that presentation. Um, and and it's, it's good that we are talking about this now. We might say we are in the UK and so the kind of problems that um, exist when it, it comes to food production, food fraud and everything does not really exist as much because there are things in place. But um, thankfully for some countries in Africa, because we've got family back home and they are eating every day. And so it's something that should concern all of us so that we can also share the knowledge we have. And I know for, for a fact that in Ghana, because I worked with Ghana Standards Authority for many years before I moved to the UK, and it's something we really take seriously. The Food and Drugs Authority is also there. Um, and so they check those things. Just, just um, as, because I know I buy certain things from Afro-Caribbean shops that come from uh, Ghana. For instance, gari, palm oil, all those things. Um, 
I know for a fact that before you can export such foods to anywhere in Europe, you will need um, you need to be registered with Ghana Standards Authority. And I have done such inspections as well. Everything is done, like she said, sampling, but we try and um, standardize certain things so that the consumer is protected. A little tip I'll add to everything Marian has said is when we are buying, wherever we are, whether in Ghana, whether in Nigeria, whether in the UK or wherever we are, something that we overlook is the expiry date and the use by date. Sometimes it is there, but I know that they are supposed to use ink that doesn't wipe off easily. So sometimes you find that it's it's not, you don't see the date completely. Some part is, is rubbed off yeah. or it's not there at all. Mm -hmm. Please don't choose such bottles or cans. Choose ones that you can see because you need to make an informed choice when you go to the shop. Don't, don't pick, they are not supposed to use ink that can wipe. And I know some people also in their corners, just to make money, like she's saying, rub the, the original expiry date and, and stamp their own. And so we need to be very careful. I, I wouldn't choose products that um, um, have ink that is rubbing off partly or something. So we need to be, be wary of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for sharing that. Um, there's a question in the chat box. So I'm going to read it out to you, Mariam. And thanks, thanks to Janet for um, telling us about your experience in Ghana. Um, let me read this first and then I'll, I'll just ask a question. So all these regulations, how are they monitored to ensure organizations are abiding by them? Sometimes those dangerous substances are included but not labeled, especially those from African shops. I went to an African shop today and I bought bread. There was mold on it, but it was in date. I questioned them and they said, because it's in date, they were not bothered. So, Mariam, do you want to say something about this? Yeah, uh, yeah, I want to say something about it. Uh, if you have gone to the African shop, let me start with that issue, the scenario, <laughs> the case study. <laughs> it's actually a case study. It so, is. <laughs> so if, if you have gone to the African shop and the um, bread has mold, whereas the best before or expiry date or whatever is still on, then that means there's a problem with that bread. It is either storage problem or transportation problem or handling problem. If that expiry date or best before date or whatever is actually genuine, because if we expect that a food product like of that nature, if the best before date is still on, then we don't expect mold to grow on that food product. So it is very, very likely that if the date is actually genuine, then maybe there's a storage problem or handling problem, or maybe when we know that handling can be in the process where the in the bakery, where the bread is being baked, and maybe it's the person that is putting in, in the bag actually contaminated it with you know biological contaminants or something like that. That is why it's having the mold. But you know, the expiry date depends on the day of production not the bread itself. They are, and most of these things, they just you know, they just determine, okay, we have produced it and we expect that we, we, with the ingredients and things like that, it's supposed to last two weeks. They just put the date of two weeks on it. So if you are, have mold, I will advise that if you see any sign of contamination, is it actually a contamination, though it's biological. So if you see any sign of contamination, you do not buy. Then another thing is, because you have said that, how do you ensure how are they being monitored? We are in a country where I believe, in quotes, actually, I believe they have very strong procedures and very strong guidelines and rules and regulations in place when it comes to food production. Even, you know, sometimes when you even go to the eateries, you see the, the hygienic creating of each of the eateries, maybe star, five stars or four stars or whatever. And I believe that there's a body that is standardizing everything and that's monitoring everything. So for this kind of food, I expect when this kind of food product like bread, I expect that that, bo that body or that organization that is ensuring safety and quality should be working on bakeries too. They should be working with bakeries too 
every bakery in the United Kingdom or in England or whatever we want to call it, we should be working with them too to ensure that they produce quality food. So I think it is the government's effort, one of the government's efforts that they establish this kind of parastatals or organizations that do all these things, that monitor this thing. So, and then the safety organization, like in my own country, we call it NAVDAC, National Agency for Food, Drug and, and, and Enforcement Control. And but the, the question is, that is why I said it is in quotes. The question is, are these organizations really performing the way they are expected to perform? That question, I cannot answer it. <laughs> that that, is that question, I think um, we would invite Janet to join the discussion. I think Janet tried to say that in Ghana, she was part of that um, organization and they were doing a lot of work ensuring that they were checking, you know, but the issue is that they check samples. And so Janet, I'll invite you to come and say something um, at some point, but I wanted to bring this in that even though there are regulations to check everything that comes in, the issue is, is everything coming through the right channel? Channel, yeah. A lot, lot of these shops, our own shops, people find, and for lack of a better word, unscrupulous ways to get these things to come into the country. Mm. You know, um, um, I haven't checked to see if this is right. I was having a discussion with this um, a group of um, um, dietitians. And then, um, Maria, maybe you would know, you know, palm oil is expected to have, we have a threshold for how much trans fats should be mm. in oil, yeah. you know. So ideally, if the oil that is being imported goes through the right channel, yeah. then they will not. They should not be in our shops. But we ourselves, our community, we find ways to bring in these mm. stuff that I, you know, uh, if they were to go through the right channel, from the backyard, they, uh, we find ways. Backyard, we, backyard roots. We, we find backyard routes to get these products onto the market, into our shops. And so they miss, you know, all of those scrutiny that they are supposed to go through. <laughs> Someone says they still pay bribe in Ghana. So, <laughs> yes, Jenna, this is where I would need your comments, you know. So someone says, even in Ghana, some people just pay bribe and then they don't get their items checked. You know, for people who are paying bribe, it means they really know that they are adulterating the products and they still want the products yeah. to come in. And then they'll find backyard, you know. Um, and Janet, are you able to say something? Um, yes. <laughs> yes. So I can't speak to the bribe one because I I, I haven't collected bribe to do that work. <laughs> um, yeah, but like you're saying, some people smuggle because we there was a case where, in fact, that importer or exporter, because she was in Ghana at the time, um, explained how she smuggled peanut butter, granite paste in those yellow jerry cans, which is meant for oil, because um, she exports palm oil as well, which is checked. She adds that and ships it. And she thinks she's, um, she's hiding in the, the British authorities. She succeeds in doing that, but this is something we haven't checked. She did it because you, it's like, you tell us what products you want to export, we come to your factory, apart from inspecting the finished products, we are constantly present, not every day, but we have inspection schedules to check the product. So we follow the products from production till export and even transportation and everything. So some people don't use the right channels. And unfortunately we are consumers, we end up having to buy these things. But what I would say is if you go to the shop and something doesn't seem right, that's why we need to educate ourselves. That's why I'm so happy that Mariam has taken time to tell us some of these things because some of us don't know it. And so we just pick anything from the shop. For instance, this moldy bread, if everybody that goes into that shop refuses to buy, that shop owner would not say as so far as it's in date, they don't mind. Yeah. It would be his loss. And so sometimes the factories, the bakeries, um, the, the producers have produced good products, but like Marian is saying, transportation storage, which our people unfortunately are not careful about. Sometimes you go to people's homes and even the way they've stored their grains and everything, other, other um, um, contaminants can come in, both physical, biological, all those things. 
So we need to educate ourselves and decide we are doing, we, we, are, we are going to, it's food we are eating into our bodies. Let's try and eat the right, right things. And um, just a, a last addition. I remember she said something about something being organic, claims of certain food. We need to be very careful. Let's investigate what we are eating and not fall for, oh, this is organic. Because of late, there's so much advertisement about so many things that are claiming so many health benefits. But really and truly, it's only, it's only advertisement. It doesn't say, it's not different from the one that doesn't say that. So we need to really be careful about what we are eating. And it's, I know somebody, one of these uh, presenters have said before that it's like an investment you're making, insurance on your body. You're putting something in your, in your body. Be concerned about it. Let's not just eat anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. And Mariam, you have a comment in the chat box. Say it's excellent presentation. And I agree 100%. You could tell from the onset that uh, she's a very passionate lecturer with the way she started and her learning outcomes and all of that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, we still have some time. So we, we still can take some questions, some comments, um, some observations, anything anyone wants to share. Now, I, I, I have something I would like to share. So this has nothing to do with food. So I traveled to Germany some time back. And in Germany, the shops, um, all of the shops have banned, you know, these um, skin whitening creams. There's, there's a popular name for, for, for that thing you find in, in, in creams that a lot of Black women use in bleaching. What's the name of that, that thing? I can't remember, you know. And, and so these have been banned in in, in Germany. Now I entered um, an African shop in, in Hamburg and I saw people going to the shop owner, you know, trying to, so if you're caught buying that skin whitening cream, you know, it, it is, it is a criminal offense. So people still found ways to, because I saw it with my own eyes, you know, to go and speak to the shop owner, make sure people were not watching who is there. And then they still purchased these products that have been banned from you know, um, um, th those those countries. So I guess the point I'm trying to make, and this has nothing to do with food, but it's this, it's just an, an analogy, is that even if these um, regulations are enforced, we also have a responsibility. We are being told, you know, we shouldn't have um, palm oil that contains a certain amount of um, trans fatty acids or, you know, certain things are not good for us. The only reason why those things will be banned is because research has shown that they are not good for us. But then we would still want to purchase it. And if you do the research and find out why people can't stop eating this, it will just be because this is what they are used to. You know, this is just what I have eaten for years. And this tastes better than the other products, you know. So irrespective of the regulations, if we as consumers will still purchase anything without scrutiny, and then, you know, we can't really blame the food producers and then the shop owners because they want to make money at the end of the day, you know. So, yes, we it's the owners lies on us. Yes, the government has its role to play. But I think we also have a bigger role because if we all do say like that example that Nushat mentioned there, if everyone said, OK, you know what, if you're not going to make sure you you supply us with good bread in quotes, we are not going to purchase the bread. If for one week they realize that the bread, the aisle for bread is, is still full, then maybe they would be careful the next time. So that's just something I wanted to share with regards to the skin whitening cream that I saw with my own eyes in Hamburg. Um, do we have any final thoughts, questions? and comments. You know, when I also like the fact that, Mariam, you brought in that example from um, Africa, because, you know, um, Janet said it's important for us to educate our families and friends in Africa. I think that it's not even the issue about educating our families. It's just because a lot of our food products are, are imported, you know, everything. Lots of us buy from African and Caribbean shops, and these things come from home, from, from the Caribbean or, or from Africa. So it is very important that we take these things seriously. First for ourselves, even before we think of um, our people or our family back in, in Africa. 
I think I'm going to stop talking now and still give people the chance. We have three, four minutes. If anyone wants to comment or ask, well, apart from liking Mariam's presentation, is it that she, it was a very clear presentation so people don't have any questions anymore? I kind of, when you talked about that horse meat scandal, I, I missed, you know, I think I, I got distracted and I, I, I didn't know what eventually happened with that issue. Maram, are you able to say anything about that? I knew at the time it made the news, but what was what was the issue eventually? Yeah, the Osme scandal was uh, because mm. it was a very big scandal in the United Kingdom and mm. a lot of people already consumed the products yes. before it was detected. So what the government did was because it was already supplied to Audi, Tesco and the normal conventional shop. The shops had to withdraw. They had to send messages out to people that if you still have this particular product that you have bought in the particular period of time, please return it to the shops. And the shops will now have to withdraw it from the store, from the shelves. And, you know, because it's been investigated and it's been confirmed that it's contaminated and it's, you no, know, there's a food fraud there. So it was withdrawn from market totally. And the supplier was, you know, there was a lot of a conviction and, uh, you know, they was arrested, arrest and things like that. And it was, you no, know, it was a court case and it was a very big case, actually. So that was what actually ended up. So, but unfortunately, some people who left will have consumed their own, their own, what they have bought from the shop and they have consumed it already before the information came out. I could remember there was, uh, there was a, uh, a similar thing happened to me. That was earlier this year. I bought a toy for my child. It mm -hmm. was this magnetic things that you can use to join together to build, construct different types of objects and things like that. And I received an email from eBay that mm -hmm. that particular product, that particular toy, the producer has informed them that it poses hazard risk. That is either I destroy it or I return it back to them. So these are the kind of things that actually happen. So immediately I just told, sorry, you cannot play with this toy anymore. This is what I've got. This is the information I've got from eBay. eBay is just a middleman, a marketing, you know, a marketing uh, middleman. So they just so, sent that email to me and you know, just to inform me that this thing is posing an hazard. So it is not left for me. If I don't want to lose my money and say, okay, I still want to keep this thing because I just don't waste my, I, want to, I don't want to waste my money. So, or I dispose it because I've been informed that it poses an hazard. So that was what actually happened with the Osmeet scandal. If information went out to so people who, potential buyers who will have bought it, some people still have it in their freezer. However, some will have consumed it by the time the information got out, but it was totally withdrawn from the market, even from the shops, from the consumers, and they had to return it back to the shops where they have bought it. And you know, there was a lot of uh, legislative case and you know, there was court case and things like that after, thereafter. Mm. Thank you, Mariam. Janet, yes, you want to come in here? Yes, please. So, um, yes. yes, there's something called recall, like he's, she said. And I've seen so many on a lot of the supermarkets. When you're entering, they put um, posters on the, on the doors mm. about products, food items that have been recalled. So you, you look at it, if you bought something within that period of time, Sometimes they write batch numbers on it. So when you, if you've not consumed it, when you go home, you, you can check. So they, they, they always put, because maybe the product is defective or they found that there has been contamination. So in the, in the um, production line from farm to fork, they have something called recall. Even if it has gone to consumers, you still have that. So please, let's, let's just check. When we are entering the shops, let's, when we see things, let's just look at it as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Now, 30 seconds, please. <laughs> Unmute yourself. <laughs> I see your hand is up. Hi. Yes. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to add a bit to it. Interestingly, it's a topic that um, came up today on um, our academy platform where people were concerned about um, um the presence of heavy metals because we are always telling people to eat healthy and all of that and if they are going to do that and um where the foods are coming from already contaminated with various things then 
we are going to have a lot of problems. So even some people were suggesting us going back to our, I think the clay ports and stuff like that. And somebody even drew our attention that even that one is not going to be safe in a few years to come because of the illegal mining activities that is going on. So a lot of um, heavy metals are going into the water, which will go into the ground and will end up in these um, clay uh, um, um, that will, will be deposited in the clay to even, that will be used to make these things work. But so it, it was really of concern and to find that we are discussing that today. It's, it's, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One thing I also want to add, I didn't join early, so I, I don't know if it's been said, but our, our cooking utensils, we tend to be, as as women, we tend to love setting a particular set or a particular utensil so much so that uh, after a while, we even when we realize that the insides are changing color and everything, we're so addicted to it, we refuse to let go. These these utensils are equally metal and can equally um, seep um, some of the metals that were made, that were used to make it. Sometimes the coating begins to wear off or we scrape a bit, so sometimes it begins to seep into the food. So we want to check that. And then nah, I think I'll have to, I'm sorry our time is up. And I, I you have no some really interesting things. I think I'm going to speak to you behind the scenes and then we'll, we'll have to do a part two of this where we can bring in some of those things you're talking about. But okay, unfortunately yeah. our time is up, but thank you. Thank you so much um, um, for your contribution. Mariam, um, 10 seconds, any final words you want to say to end the session? I know your time is up, but just- Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would just advise, uh, what I want to say as a roundup is just for us to be more meticulous and uh, scrutinize what, whatever we want to buy, whether we are buying from the conventional uh, detail sure. school shops or whatever, or we are going to the African Caribbean shops to buy food products. It is very, yeah. very important that we have to be meticulous where we want to buy. We don't just buy. We have to scrutinize before we buy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariam. Someone says it was a good presentation. I'm guilty of not checking the expiry date until I get back. Cordelia, you are not the only one. We, we all have to start making changes right from today's talk. So thank you everyone for the engagement. I could see that people were very, very attentive. And that also shows that our presenter is a fantastic teacher and so um i'm hoping that we can have her in the next few um, um weeks again to do another interesting topic on this note i'm going to hand it over to khan and orlando for our next session i hope to see you all next week it's a very very interesting topic it has to do with this new weight loss medication by nhs so please do join us to learn more about it thank you very much and have a good evening thank you Thank you, Dr. Hibber. Thank you, Marion, for that amazing seminar. Hope everybody enjoyed and took plenty of notes. All right, so it's time for the exercise part of today's session. I hope people will stay on, because today we have a boxercise session planned, okay? Boxercise. For tonight's session, all you'll need is plenty of space and plenty of water and a good fighting attitude. All right, people, so let's get straight into it. Time's click taken. Let me sort my music out. Okay, let's get straight into our royal people. Let me focus this. We're going to start just with some nice light straights. Okay, so straight uh, jabs and crosses. Okay, lefts and rights or rights and lefts. Okay, let's get ready. Three, two, one. Give me straight. Let's go. Keep it nice and light. Try to get the blood flowing through the body. Get the heart rate up. Warm them shoulders up. Keep that going, people. Three, two, one. Now we show me uppercuts now. Really roll them shoulders. Let's go. Of 
Keep going, people. Oh, next one, show me some books now. Books. Really turn that lower body towards the foot. <laughs> Start going, my people. Three, two, one. Next one, shadow skips. Let's go. Bring it. Shadow skips. Make sure you turn those wrists. Keep that balance up. We're beginning to get warm now, people. Three. Oh, now rest, people. Give yourself 20 seconds. Take a quick sip of water. We're going to go straight back into that water. All right, people, last few sips of water, back to your spaces. Let's continue with this warm-up, okay? So we're going to go straight back in with a shadow skip, a 30-second shadow skip. Get ready, three, two, one, go! Let's up the pace a little bit now with warm. We go a little bit faster. Two. Oh, back to your homes. Going, my people. Three, two, one, time, people. Okay, give yourself a quick 30 second break. Take on some more water, and then we're going to go to round number one. Well done. Thank you. 
10 seconds, people. Okay, people, back to your spaces. Let's climb in that ring now. Game time now. Round one coming your way. All right, so first round, we have a combination round, okay? So we're going to work on putting a series of punches together in a nice combination, all right? So nice and easy for your first 60 seconds. As always, we've got three-minute rounds, full three-minute rounds. So first 60 seconds, in your guard, we're looking for power now, strength, so really hard, snappy punches. Remember, make sure you're putting your whole body into your punching, into your boxing, okay? It's not just about the shoulders. Put that full body into it, okay? Get that power, get that strength from the floor. So we're going to be here. One, two, three, four, nice and hard. In your guard again. One, two, three, four. Remember when we box, you are boxing a mirror image of yourself. All right, so on your jabs, I don't want you, if you're my height, I'm not going to be punching there or there or up here. I'll be punching right to my face, right to my chin height. So I'm going to be here, one, two, three, four, nice and sharp, one, two, three, four, right to my own face, my own mirror image. All right, so nice and easy, four punches, jab, cross, jab, cross, get two or three in the same spot, make sure you use your whole floor, so turn around, get some here, one, two, three, four, use your whole floor, all right, after 60 seconds, we'll add to the combination. All right, people, let's get busy, round number one now, get inside. Get ready now. Let's go on the truck now. In the guard now. Get ready. Job cross, job cross. Three, two, one, go. Are you working, people? Jab cross, jab cross, nice and sharp. Ten seconds. Two, one, let's pause the clock. Okay, let's add to it now, people. So after that last cross, I need 10 uppercuts. But this time we're going for speed. Remember the first four punches. Nice and powerful, then bam, then uppercut, nice and quick. Let's get ready, three, two, one, go. Let's go, people. Jab, cross, jab, cross. Ten uppercuts for speed. Come on, my Okay, last addition now, people. So after that last uppercut, we're coming straight back up with the left hand and 10 straight for speed. Watch the whole thing now. So we're here. One, two, three, four. Nice and strong. 10, 10. And then we start back with the half four. Let's go, get ready, three, two, one, go. 
Ten seconds, people. I said, I have one. That's me, like, two, one, that's the bell, people. Back to your corners now. Take a 30 second water break and then we're straight back in the ring. We had a kid from the front. Okay, people, bring it back to your spaces now. Round two, back in the ring now. So next round we've got is a leg round boxing combinations. All right, so we're going to be a leg round. And we're going to go. We're going to pyramid the punches. We're going to pyramid the leg exercise. Okay, so watch me now. The first move we're going to go jab, cross, cross. From there, I need two squats. So two squats. Mm -hmm. Then we're back in. So now I need two combinations. That's one. That's two. Now I need four squats. Okay, so four squats, nice and quick. Four. Then lastly, I need three of those combinations. Jab, cross, hook, cross. Jab, cross, hook, cross. And then jab, cross, hook, cross. And finally, I need six squats. Once you've gone through that, we start back at one. So one combination, two squats, two combinations, four squats, three combinations, six squats. And we'll go throughout that throughout the round. All right, people, let's get busy. Game time. Come on. Yes, get ready. Start with one combination, two squats. Get ready, people. Three, two, one, go. Two now. Four squats. Three combinations, six squats. Once I've done that three and six, straight back to one and two. Four steps. Let's go, people. Keep that going. Mm -hmm. 
well done, people. That's halfway, 90 seconds gone. Keep the good work up, people. Come on. Keep going, people. Last 45 seconds now. Thirty seconds, people. Keep those combos coming. Keep the swap coming. Let's work. Come on. Five, four, three, two, one. That's that beautiful. Well done. Back to your corners. 30 second water break. We're going to our third and final round. Well done. Seconds, people. Okay, people, let's step back in the ring now. Last round coming your way, and it's going to be a cardio conditioning round. Cardio and conditioning round. All right, so. It's going to be broken. This round will be broken into six 30 second segments. All right. Combos will stay the same throughout the round, but the cardio condition exercise will change. All right. So, first 30 seconds, all I want you to do in your guard. Actually, no, we're going to go straight up. So, straight up, both legs facing forward. I need 10 straights, nice and quick. 10 uppercuts, 10 above the head. Okay. Then we'll go back straight here. 10 straights. 10 uppercuts, 10 above the head, 30 seconds. Once those 30 seconds are done, we've got switch kicks here. So we're gonna be here, and we're gonna be nice and explosive. Okay, if that's too much, then we'll go forward step, forward step, forward step. But if you can, if you're able to, we're gonna be here. The ball to the feet, nice and explosive. And then we're gonna go straight back into our combo after another 30 seconds. All right, people, so here straight up, 10, 10, 10, 30 seconds, and then here, or here, for 30 seconds. Let's go, people, let's give it a try now, come on. Everything else, people. Three, two, one, go on, combo first. Ten. 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 Ten.
Two. One, let's go switches. Oh, people, ten seconds. Two, one, back to double now. I've got you. Dead. Okay. Oh, I'm asking now back to combo. Last 30 seconds, two, one, switch, kids, go. Keep going, people. 10 seconds. Two, one, I die, people are done. Take a 20 second water break and it will strengthen up. Well done. Okay, people, join me back in the middle now. Let's get a quick stretch up. Let's start with the neck. Let's take our neck side to side. Nice and gentle. Ear to shoulder and reach across. The waist, nice big rotations here. Change directions for me. I have a round, swing it forward. And backwards. Change arms. And backwards. Uh, 
That's one. Legs together. We're going to pull the knee. Stretch it to the side. Change legs. Pull the knee. Stretch to the side. Let's go. Take it all off, people. Uh, now it's time. Well done, people. Give yourself a big pat on the back for that session. Sam, are you back in the studio? Are you still about? Yeah, I'm back in the studio. Yes. Well done, everyone. Well done, Orlando. That was a very powerful session. Great punches, great technique. I'm sure the people, wherever they're watching, are also throwing those hands and getting ready to get in the ring. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Sam, I think you might have cut off. You cut off, Sam? No, no, I'm still here. I'm still here. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I hope everyone enjoyed that session tonight. Enjoy the way. Yeah, cool. well, thank you, Victoria. Yeah. Great to hear you participating. So, yeah, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'm sure you enjoyed the conversation that Dr. Had, uh, the lecturer had today. Um, and I learned a couple of things as well. Got to read those labels and see what they're putting in those foods because, you know, we don't want to be eating horse like we were <laughs> a couple of years back. So, yeah, thank you for tuning in, everyone. Uh, feel free to join us next week, same time, same place. If there's any changes, that will be, that'll be, con uh, that'll be told to you by the social media or the group chats or the e bulletin. So thank you very much again for everyone for tuning in today. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, Orlando. You have a wonderful evening too. Well, That's goodbye from us. Thank you, Sam.